So, good evening, everybody. Thank you for waiting. Uh, we're ex expecting some other guests, uh, and we think concerning traffic, um, there will be others coming a little bit lately. So, thanks for waiting. My name is Jörg Süßenbach. I'm the director of the Goethe Institute here in Boston. And I uh, want to wa welcome you warmly for a special event tonight, um, a re reflection on Jay Scheib's um, Parsival of the Bayreuther Festspiele this summer. When Annette Klein, our wonderful program officer over there, and I heard that Jay Scheib is going to um, prepare this uh, production of Parsival, this year in Bayreuth, and he's going to use you both, I introduce you later, uh, the AR technology. Um, we thought it could be a great occasion to have a special in view afterwards here at the Goethe Institute because we assumed that only a few people of Boston could have the opportunity to attend there in person and see these, I don't know, seven or eight shows in Bayreuth. Um, as you know, ticket sales is not easy. You get them really hard, and it's a long journey over there. So uh, we were very happy when you answered our question whether you can do this here uh, at the Goethe Institute Boston um, and let us have a, a show behind the curtain, so to say, um, and learn something about um, how this ha uh, happened and... Um, maybe a little bit about the circumstances, about the obstacles you were faced with. And of course, uh, we've been interested in this topic because it's Bayreuth, which is, as you know, a very special place. Uh, maybe most of you know that uh, in this little Franconian city, there was built a special theater in 1875 by Wagner and for Wagner. He was the owner after some payback to the König Ludwig, which gave him credits, um, because he wanted a theater for his own conditions. He wanted to have a special room where the audience could focus on that what's happening on the stage. He wanted to have this room dark, and he wanted to have the orchestra under a plate, how you call it, orchestra pit, which made this place very, very special and famous. Um, Another thing is only his 10 operas are going to be played there every summer. And another special thing is that the direction was from the very beginning until today, always in the hands of a family member. Whether this will continue, we had this discussion a few minutes ago, we don't know, but it was from that time up to now. Um, we all know that in the 20s of the last century until World War II, Wagner, Bayreuth, and the Nazis stood closely, and Hitler was a friend of the family, and that there sh should have been a new start, so a restart after World War II. And I think in the late 40s or early 50s, the two grandsons of Richard Wagner, um, Win Winifred, no, sorry, uh, Winfried, Wieland, and Wolfgang, Wieland and Wolfgang um, became an artistic director, and especially Wolfgang <coughs> was the one who was opening the doors widely to new ways of directing these maybe well-known pieces. He invited some upcoming younger directors like uh, the famous Patrice Chéron in the 70s, and maybe another example is Christoph Schlingensief, 2004, I guess, with another Parsifal. And uh, the interesting thing in Bayreuth is that most of these, you know, works from younger directors get really, really booed during the premiere. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was a scandal on, I, I think, Patrice Chirou for sure, and I know from Schlingensief as well. But things changed. And um, as we know, the work from Patrice Chéron is now called the so-called Jahrhundert Ring, the Ring of the Century, a remarkable work. And I think the, the, the opinion how, how Christoph Schlingensief did changed quite a lot as well. So why do I mention that? We can talk about that. <laughs> there, there was an interesting reception of Jay's work as well, and 
I'm very, very sure that there will be uh, a lot of discussion in the next years as well about what criteria do we use for making our, ourselves an opinion about this kind of work. Um, since 2015, Wagner's great-granddaughter, Katerina, has been artistic director, and she was the one who invited Jay, I don't know when, but maybe 2018 or maybe earlier. Um, last but not least, maybe to mention that the actual construction, how decisions are made with four different stakeholders in Bayreuth is in discussion. Some journalists claim that one of the stakeholders, the Friends of Bayreuth, have too much influence and that they should be responsible that not enough money was for buying, in your case, enough glasses for the show, which was promptly denied from the Freunde of Bayreuth. <laughs> so I don't know what is true. Um, but in German, uh, it could say that Bayreuth is eine, now I use a German word, Schlangengrube, which means a snake pit. <laughs> a lot of forces. Not so easy to see who's guilty and not. But now, I guess we are all very curious uh, that Jay shares his inspiration behind the production, as well as the technical and institutional challenges along the way. He's joined by video and AR designer Joshua Higginson, thank you for being here as well, who was deeply involved in the production. If you know more about the two both impressive careers of Jay and <clears throat> Joshua, please have a look on our website. This evening is the start of a new series in which we want to highlight the works of Boston-based artists in Germany. The next event will take place on November 2nd and is entitled History is Listening, Resonifying Nuremberg with Boston University professor Louis Judy Sokai, who, in cooperation with international musicians and theorists, has turned the former Nuremberg Nazi party rally grounds into the matter of an acoustic experiment and is going to present this artist's interesting work at that night. So you're warmly welcome to join us. And finally, another announcement. I want to mention four special events at the 28th and 29th of October because I assume that some of you could be interested. Long-standing Boston Globe's music critics, Jeremy Eichler, released his new book, Time Echo, recently, in which he showed deep entanglement, entanglements between the work of composers like Schoenberg, Richard Strauss, Britton and Shostakovich, and the time of Second World War and Holocaust. In each of these four events, one of the composers will be portrayed and his music will be played live. So please come on the 28th and 29th of October. But now, I want to hand over to Jay. Thank you so much for coming. I think we have uh, three parts, uh, a little presentation of your side, Jay, then afterwards you take over, Josh, and then we have an open stage and you can ask some questions. No, there's a fourth part. We're gonna have a little reception afterwards in our back room. So thanks for coming. You all, thank you, Jay, and thank you, Josh. Thank you so much for having us. Um, the Goethe Institute has been a friend for so long and I'm so thankful that you guys are here. Yeah, thank you. Um, also, oh. sorry about that. Um, but I, I just thought I would throw this up on the screen because I, I don't know if I agree with it, but most of the time, you know, throughout the process of presenting and developing this work, bringing AR and also VR to Bayreuth, singers kept saying like, oh man, I'm gonna be out of a job. I keep like telling people, no way. This is forever, this business of singing. <gasps> scusa, scusa. I'm a professional. <laughs> yes, perfect, thank you, thank you. So, yeah, I'm just gonna leave that there. So today, uh, or this evening, I just kind of wanna go as fast as possible in a way through what kind of like stood behind the vision and a little bit about the process. And then um, I'll turn it over to Josh to show all of the fabulous images and video. Um, <laughs> some of which is like actually like being seen for the first time by me. Um, 
because of course it's like very difficult to record what happens in AR, right? And, um, Josh figured out a way to do it and actually stayed up in the auditorium recording bits of the AR in the auditorium of the Feshbiel House the night before the premiere. Um, and so we're gonna show a little bit of that footage. Interestingly, I can't wait to see it. So, um, uh, was it, first of all, just a funny, since we're a small enough group, like, was anyone at the performance? You were there? Wow. And you had glasses. Yeah, me too. Right, right. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Which is sort of like sitting in the very back of like a really old airplane because there's no leg room, right? Yes, absolutely. I, I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, <laughs> it is only a four-hour opera. Um, <laughs> so w one of the... Okay, uh, yes, 2000, 2018, I received a call from, um, I received a, an email and then a phone call uh, from Bayreuth, from the offices of Katarina Wagner saying, dear, dear Mr. Scheib, um, Frau Wagner would, would very much like to meet with you. Would you be available on such and such a date? It was like about three weeks from that moment. <laughs> and I, when my, when I picked my jaw up off the floor, I thought, "Wow!" Um, and I replied, "Yeah, sure, I'll be there." And um, and they replied, "Great. The meeting will last. We'll, we'll, the meeting will begin at um, 10 a.m. and we'll plan to finish around five. And <laughs> the longest meeting I've ever been involved in, or I've never been invited to a theater for such a long meeting. And um, over the course of the conversation, it, it kind of like began, it began with the question of, as to whether, as to whether I thought there might be um, a possibility of, of using AR or VR in an, in an, op, in an opera, in an opera production. And, and at that moment, we were talking about working together, collaborating on a, on a major project that would be actually, you know, not until late 2020s. And I, and around three hours into the meeting, she said, oh no, forget it. Why don't you do, uh, why don't you do a project in, in two years? Because I was like, well, AR is going to be completely in our world soon. And as I always do, I said, yes, of course we can do it. Oh, I'm so sorry. So AR refers to, um, augmented reality and and so to back up a little bit about this about just what exactly that means um, if you could imagine uh, you know if you ever have you ever seen snapchat or Facebook and, P, and even with your phone you can put like funny glasses on an image or little hearts around one's face um, that in a way is already a kind, is augmented reality in effect, in effect. Like that's a very easy version of describing it. Um, but effectively, virtual reality, I'll just show it, I mean. Okay, how's that better? Okay, I'll stay really close to this microphone. Um, as mentioned, uh, Otto Bruchwald and Richard Wagner designed the Feshbiel House in, uh, and it opened in 1876 uh, with uh, Parsifal premiering in 1882. And interestingly, Parsifal is the opera that takes full advantage of the acoustic um, possibilities of the house. And, and in, until Wagner's death, it was not allowed to be performed anywhere other than uh, in Bayreuth. And actually maybe it was, yeah, I'm not sure exactly the date. I think. It, it was sort of the early 20th century before it was performed anywhere else. Um, one of the unique features in the, th in the opera house is, um, is this cover that goes over the orchestra pit, um, the uh, Orchestre Grabe, and this is known as an Orchestre Schal, the Orchestre Schal. So it, it's a kind of bowl-shaped cover which which creates um, on the one hand um, a visual a kind of visual 
advantage to the piece. It, it, makes the, it makes it such that you don't see the orchestra and you don't see the conductor from the auditorium. And also almost no light from the orchestra, which is quite different from it, most of the opera houses that we know today. Um, interestingly, sound comes out of the orchestra pit, it goes onto the stage, and then comes back out into the auditorium. So for a conductor, they're sort of giving cues, like not at the same time as one would with the music, because of how the sound, because of how the sound moves. So for, for a conductor, the mix is completely strange, <laughs> which I, I always marvel at. And it's, it's sort of why there's so much talk about the great conductors in Bayreuth, because it's, it's really this whole, this whole auditorium is like a musical instrument. You, you can feel the first notes of Parsifal literally coming out of the floor. You feel it sometimes before you hear it in some parts of the auditorium, which I find f remarkable. Um, and so the first, thing that, the first thing that I did without even really knowing what I was doing, because I didn't know what I was doing, I, I contacted some folks to make a laser scan of the theater. And so we, the sort of first thing, the first sort of step in the process was to develop a giant large scale digital model um, that would be millimeter accurate um, of the entire Feshbeel house. Um, and, I, and this is what I did during COVID. I learned that I was not capable of handling 17 million points in space. Um, um, and um, we rapidly spun up a team to work on it. Um, and here, this is just an image of the digital model. And um, later you'll see it, it, it does actually look quite similar. <laughs> um, and inside of this space then we began prototyping, um, totally digitally. Um, all the boxes, all the seats. Um, and then COVID hit. And during COVID, of course, the Bayreuth Festspiel was shut down. Um, our production was also like threat. It was like not clear what was going to happen. Everything just, of course, like the rest of the world went dark. Um, and finally, um, I was contacted by Katarina. We met and she was like, okay, look, we're, you know, everything is canceled, but next year or in the coming it was like nine months before the next festival would start, they decided to do a sort of experimental ring. And they um, asked us if we would present just a small portion of the ring, also as a way of introducing a digital idea to the, to the audience. And so we developed a VR um, virtual reality scene from uh, Siegfried. Um, Zai Siegfried, we called it, in which Basically, you put on a, a headset and you have an opportunity to um, uh, fight the dragon, <laughs> literally, a first, person, uh, a first person Wagner opera shooter game. We had to do it outdoors and um, so we modeled all of these different um, approaches to having enough you know, space outdoors that no one would be at risk of being ill, getting ill and um, this is kind of what we, we ended up with. Maybe there were a few more stations, but we um, ended up with these like little tents because as we all know, it does rain in Bayreuth sometimes. Um, and, um, and during the intermissions of Valkyrie, people came out of the auditorium, put on headsets, and then uh, were transported back into the theater. They had just been witnessing an opera where a dragon comes through the wall and, um, and uh, Stefan Gould, um, the great Stefan Gould, um, uh, sings uh, Siegfried um, in the headset. Um, this was when I learned um, exactly how powerful the, the audience is in, in Bayreuth, uh, because many people sang the part out loud <laughs> while in the headset, word for word, perfectly. Um, even putting their hand in their mouth after the blood of the dragon is on, uh, comes onto the hand, which is a stage direction. Rarely happens in productions because, eh, but it's a stage direction. And in that moment, Siegfried is able to understand the birds in the forest 
because he's tasted the blood of the dragon. And in our version, you float up above the seats, which is quite scary, actually. <laughs> um, just some, some looks. Some <laughs> you know, people, people often began quite grouchy looking at it, like, I'm not going to put that on, and um, then ended up you know, having a really good time, which was, it was fun, actually. Yep, yep, I said it. Fun. <laughs> Um, some more pictures, hello. Um, this is a scene from the game, and um, I'm just gonna zip through. This is Marcus Thompson, the great uh, violist uh, and professor at MIT who played the conductor. Uh, so he gives you the cue to uh, stab the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Marcus, by the way, played in the orchestra pit uh, in the ring when um, Wieland uh, was at the Met in 1967. Yeah, 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 something like that. More dragons. I'm gonna just jump past this because I, well, how about this? I'll just show a quick moment. Yeah, so um, I did bring a headset and, you know, during the reception, maybe some folks can uh, check it out. Oops. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go back to this one more time. Ver bist du? Yeah, good, good sentence from a dragon. Um, who are you? Um, quite dark. Okay, Parsifal. Um, okay, so Parsifal, the thing that really drove Parsifal for us had a lot to do with, um, you know, coming out of COVID, coming out of, you know, all of the various reckonings that we went through and are still going through in the United States, particularly, you know, following the murder of George Floyd and really like a lot happened in this time, right? And I think that for that reason, we, we tried to hew very closely to the text and not, um, you know, sort of come with a conceit that we would pound a, an interpretation on top of the work. Whether that's still like the best idea, I don't know, but in any event, we like stayed actually like very close to the text. And in the, and in the making of it, we, we tried to, really like work out, because it can be a very confusing drama. We really tried to work out a very exacting kind of character direction throughout the whole process, um, which I think really comes through on film, not always necessarily on stage, and there's some things that we're changing um, in the coming year, um, because Bayreuth is a work workshop, Werkstatt Bayreuth. We will work on it again this summer and continue to develop it over the next years. Um, but this was one of the mottos that we started with. A hole bigger than the thing the hole is in. <laughs> um, because of the, you know, the, 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 to the topic of wounds, of being wounded, is a major theme, of course, in Parsifal. And um, muss man seine eigenen Wunde kennenlernen, oder? Um, you have to somehow get to get to know your own wounds, right? And this became um, this became a kind of secondary theme for us. You know, understand your wound, um, um, and then uh, 
jumping back to AR because we're going to transition to Josh, who has the most beautiful images. Um, we we came up with like a kind of set of use cases for for using AR, basically hoping to like find ways to draw the virtual into the real, to make you know to borrow a to borrow a, a mission statement from the media lab to draw bits nearer to atoms and atoms nearer to bits, right? Um, and so our four use cases were effectively to um, extend the stage architecture so that in the glasses you could look to your left, look to your right, look below you, look above, and, and the world of the stage could be expanded. Some of those works, some of those were technically incredibly difficult to accomplish. Um, uh, atmospherics and particles, you know, for dust or smoke or clouds or rain. It's sometimes very hard to make it rain in a theater auditorium. Um, and so sacred geometries and sacred objects. Um, because this is, you know, Parsifal is, a, is an opera in which it takes place in a time in which somehow magic is still possible. Like people still have visions, you know, th that things still have magical properties somehow. Um, and so we, we sought to create a world in which um, geometries and objects might appear out of thin air. Um, and then character animations, which for us meant that we would add characters on the stage, but they would be virtual characters who would kind of like somehow just belong in the world alongside the performers. A fox, uh, a couple that are First they're making out and then they burst into flames. A little boy carrying a pair of wings, um, things like this. Um, here's some early renderings from, um, from the room, adding trees into, this, into the architecture of the theater. Floating a giant tree in space in the, in the prelude. Um, yeah, I just included a couple of sketches to be like, yeah, I make sketches on airplanes and then we try to build them. Um, there's a rock, a Josh Higgison rock. Um, a plastic bag. Um, you know, having seen so many plastic bags floating around, we, we then also imagined, well, when everything is said and done and we're all long gone, there will likely still be plastic bags floating and um, and so we we created these these kind of uh, digital compositions that became that became key to the AR world cobalt because cobalt is what powers our our devices right and we all you know every other every other week there's a new article about a cobalt mine here or there or human rights violations here or there um, and particularly in the Congo, um, which at the time this opera premiered was shortly after what is known as the Great African Scramble, in which at the Berlin Conference, the borders were redrawn in Africa and in a very, very intense movement toward um, the exploitation of both, um, I think both natural resources and also uh, human resources um, began on that continent. It had already begun in the United States in a, in a very intense way. And, and so we, we thought a lot about cobalt as a kind of energy giving source and it eventually became actually also the object of the grail itself. It's just an image from, from the stage where there's a, video, a live camera video projection and uh, some plastic bottles because they will also be here forever and a tumbleweed. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Maybe. Um, the swan, which Josh will get into in more depth. Uh, the, uh, Parsifal shoots a swan. He shoots it because it's flying and I guess because he doesn't really know any better. But having shot the swan, he has his first like really like face-to-face -face experience with empathy, um, which becomes a very important moment, a very, a sort of launching pad for him, for Parsifal to start reckoning with his own uh, wounds, as it were. Um, there's an AR version of a very bloody swan 
And meanwhile, we see on the video, they're treating the wound of the actual swan on stage. There's our taxidermy swan, which is also a kind of virtual swan <laughs> in its way. Um, uh, the costumes, I would say, are, you know, of course, like the yellows and the whites are a very sort of low-key, low-key nod to certain Catholic rituals. But the, the other bits of the costumes were a kind of um, camouflage, um, camouflage based on uh, brook trout, actually. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to go quickly through these and then turn it over to Josh. Um, a photograph from the final moments just before Parsifal smashes the grail. Um, the first act. <coughs> and the third act. <coughs> the magic garden. Uh, you know, I've been asked many times if we made this decision for Pink based on the movie Barbie. And I, I just want to say, we made this decision roughly two and a half years ago. <laughs> Um, because that, that's how long it takes to produce um, so many costumes. Um, um, the great Georg Zeppenfeld playing Gernemans. Andrea Schläger. Uh, Ekaterina Gubanova. Yeah, there we go. Um, and, and finally, just like as a quick nod, you know, we we developed these like studios and seminars at MIT and these are some photos of um, some like funny AR experiments from my class augmenting opera where we worked on, on Parsifal as well. And um, Josh also runs a, a great interactive design studio and that's what I got. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Josh. Come, come, come. Welcome, I'm so glad you all can be here. Jay, thank you for all of those wonderful um, images and thoughts in front of us. Um, yeah, what I'm gonna talk about is really some of the technical and logistic um, things that we were dealing with and what we were trying to create. Um, as we started with a little bit of information about um, what augmented reality is and what virtual reality um, is. Uh, just to give a quick reiteration again, like, um, you know, VR, the, the Cy Siegfried piece that Jay showed, is something that is completely virtual. It's all contained inside of a headset, so you are experiencing it like a video game and you're seeing none of the real physical world around you. You're sort of locked into your own virtual world. Um, with augmented reality, which is where we kind of took Parsifal, we had this huge challenge of trying to produce a real live opera in front of everyone with physical things happening, but on top of that, adding in a whole other virtual element on top of it, to, so that we had something that um, could be, uh, you know, the trickiest thing about the whole proposition is that only a quarter of the audience is able to see the, the augmented reality. Because of cost and logistic constraints and a whole bunch of other reasons, um, there were only 330 people in the audience out of 2,000 who could see the augmented reality. So we had to make an opera that was both amazing and interesting and um, told a very important story on its own without any augmented reality. And then on top of that, we're trying to add something into this that sort of gave everyone who was able to see it uh, a little extra. You know, so these extra signs, these extra symbols, these extra um, bits of information. So. I'm gonna talk a little bit just about the, the physical things. So as Jay, Jay showed earlier, we ended up using these augmented reality glasses. They're essentially sunglasses with little screens in them. Um, one of the big, huge issues that we had to tackle, as, as Jay sort of pointed out, was this idea of how to merge the physical and the virtual. So we did have to go to the space, make this big laser scan, and then try and figure out how we can put images that actually line up with the architecture in the space. And we actually spent two years trying to figure out a way to make this work. And we tested a bunch of different methods. Um, one of the things that these glasses try to, can use is they have two little cameras that are um, up in the top corners. And these cameras are set up to do what's called uh, SLAM tracking, which stands for simultaneous, simultaneous location and mapping. 
And basically what it's doing is it's constantly taking photos of the environment around it and trying to identify recognizable um, symbols to it. So things that we had mapped in the laser scan or had mapped through uh, photogrammetry, which is when we take a bunch of photographs of an environment and make a 3D model out of it. Um, the cameras are sort of constantly looking for um, where they are in a physical space. And so we had to go through a bunch of different tests and methods to try and figure out a way to make this work. Um, we found a way that it would work great if the lights would stay the same through the whole show and if the lights were always on through the entire opera. Um, as Jay talked about, this is an opera house that is famously dark. It is one of the darkest opera houses you can work in in the world. So as soon as the lights went down, all of a sudden everything just goes, goes away and it doesn't work. So we spent a ton of time sort of trying to work, work into a method that we could, um, could, could keep images persistent where we wanted them in the 3D space um, and still enjoy a, a normal opera, the way that we would, we would want to see it, where we have super dark moments and super bright moments and all sorts of things in between. Um, these are just a couple more shots of some of the glasses. Um, like I said, we had 330 that we ended up using. Each set of glasses is connected to a little computer that was stationed underneath the chairs, which I'll show in a moment. Um, this is a view from the boxes at the back of the theater space uh, with the glasses. Uh, this is a shot from the center of the Opera House back towards the back, and this is mostly just to show where we actually ended up having uh, the seating locations for the glasses. So the last three rows of the bottom, uh, of the, main, uh, of the main seating area is where we, we position the glasses. This, uh, this was a very conscious choice. We were trying to keep the glasses isolated in a specific area so as not to disturb the, the <laughs> famously um, easily disturbed audience of Bayreuth. Uh, I think the first time Jay and I went to see a piece there uh, during COVID when we were preventing, uh, presenting Cy Siegfried, I think somebody was having a heart attack in the back row and probably four rows in front of them, people were turning around and sh trying to shush them and tell them to please have their heart attack quieter. So this is, this is the environment that we were working in in this place. So knowing that even if these glasses are absolutely silent, even if they're putting out you know, very small bits of light, that it would subconsciously just bother everyone else in the space. Um, we were very strategic about where we placed, placed people. So we, did, we put them in the back three rows, and then we also did the front row of each of the balcony um, or gallery spaces in the back. Um, the, so below every seat back there, there is a small computer that got placed, um, a special power system that had to get put in place, uh, running a, a low voltage power supply to power all of the computers that were there. Um, the, the computers were installed and left. They were uh, kept there for the entire summer, but the glasses had to be taken out and put back in every single performance so as not to disturb the other performances. And because this is a big opera festival that's running in repertory, every night it's a different show. So there was a huge amount of labor and logistic that had to go into just installing the glasses, checking that they were all working, um, making sure that, <laughs> that nothing was broken, and then uh, deinstalling them at the end of every performance. And putting corrective lenses. Yeah, this is great. So from somebody who was actually there, um, you know, one, one of the reasons that we sort of decided to go with, with these specific glasses um, was uh, because of the form factor. So there are other augmented reality headsets. There are, um, you know, Microsoft HoloLens is a, a famous one. It costs about four times as much as these, which was another logistic that we had to deal with. But um, it fits all over your, it sits on top of your head and is a big strap and is incredibly heavy. I actually find it hard to keep it on for more than about 20 minutes at a time. This is a four hour opera. <laughs> you have to keep these things on your, on your head for a very long time. So um, partially we went with something like this so it wouldn't disturb people's hair if they had gotten fancy hair done for that performance. You know, people, men who had gone out to the barber that day to get a new haircut, we didn't want to disturb their hair. Um, we also wanted to have something that was easy to put on and take off um, in the performance, something that didn't require a lot of instruction for how they needed to work. So something that had a common uh, form factor became quite important for us. Um, yeah, there were, there, 
Typically, you know, augmented reality right now, we're on the cusp of this stuff becoming very common in the world, but to be perfectly honest, right now, we're a little ahead of the curve. Um, the, the hardware is not incredibly reliable yet. Um, it's not very comfortable, and it is, it's typically meant for a single user to use. So it's set up so that you're using it in a, a local location, like, in fact, on your desk or a table in front of you, not in a gigantic opera house where you are 60 meters from the thing that you're looking at. Um, and you're, they're set up to, for your own glasses to be, corrective lenses to be put in them, or for the nose pieces to be custom fit to what your, what your nose piece needs to be. And so every performance, these had to be custom fit for every person in the audience um, who was wearing them. Unfortunately, for some people, <laughs> You know, you can talk later, uh, some people didn't have a great experience with the way that they fit. Some of them would slide down on their noses, um, the, the note that they were notoriously hot on people's foreheads in a place where there is no air conditioning in the summer. Um, all of these sort of uh, little gripes and complaints were, were definitely out there about the hardware that we chose. Um, and again, unfortunately, I, it's just not quite there yet. I think in three more years, this technology is gonna be very common and we're gonna see it all over the place and people might start using it in their own homes a lot more. But part of the reason that this was exciting to work on is that we're, this is the first place that has done this kind of work. This Bayreuth was so generous to want to do this experiment. So the fact that they even did 330 glasses, I think was like incredibly adventurous and very exciting. Um, and yeah, really, really was something that I was uh, enthusiastic about trying, trying, even though the technology is really not ready yet. Um, this is uh, just to show a little bit of how we were sort of putting the work together. So uh, as Jay mentioned, we're building a whole 3D model of the theater, and then we're basically working in a video game engine called um, Unity, and we have this virtual model of the theater and we're placing things within that virtual model and then trying to uh, build a little video game, put it in the headset and then check and make sure everything lines up where we think it's going to line up in the physical world. So this is um, Orshi who is a, a creative developer who's based in Paris and in London uh, who came out to work with us for a month. Um, but she's sitting here in front of our, our little video game engine uh, showing the virtual model of the theater and then we're trying to fit everything into to what we're, um, we're putting together. Uh, this is also just like a couple of assets just to say that everything that we start to put in here, we have to make these like 3D models of every single element that goes into this, create custom uh, animation timelines, create custom uh, cues, and build a whole bunch of really complicated infrastructure in order to make this, this work. Um, for those of you that haven't worked on a lot of opera or live performance, one thing that you will know is that you can't just hit go at the beginning of the show and hope that it's going to play out the whole way through like a film. Unfortunately, every night, everything is a little bit different. The conductor's tempo is a little bit different. The performers might be a little bit faster, a little bit slower each night. So we have to create a bunch of, a bunch of custom cues that somebody is uh, live working with the score and hitting go every time we need a different timeline to start, every time we need something to fade out or fade in, uh, every time we need something to happen, we have somebody who is listening to the music and hitting go every time we, we uh, need something to happen. I think in the end, the show had somewhere around 500 cues, um, maybe more. <laughs> there were a ton, of, a ton of cues in the piece in the end, but every single one of those things that uh, has to happen in the show has to have its own custom 3D animation, its own custom uh, timeline, all of its own custom work gets put into each of these things. Um, Jay already showed a quick virtual model of the space, but this is a, a virtual model of our space. And then, uh, so next I have a, a quick video, about a three minute video of um, some of the content that we saw in the piece. So I do need to preface it a little bit to say that um, because we are not able to record a lot of the live performance with the AR, as Jay sort of talked about, it's an incredibly complicated process in the end. Um, there, there are only a few clips in this piece, in this video of the live performance with the um, augmented reality. And the other thing I should say is that they are, um, it, it's all recorded on a cell phone. Ultimately, all of this technology is we're building a video game that runs on, on uh, cell phone technology. So it is a, a big, 
a big issue that it's in order to get this onto like quality cinema grade cameras is a very, very expensive process. Um, it is something that is becoming very, very common these days, but it is an incredibly expensive uh, <laughs> way to record, record performance. So what you will see, um, and I do think it's sort of important to point out before we get there, is that a lot of the technology, um, we've put these 3D animations around you, floating around the audience, and so when you are wearing these glasses and you start to look and see things in different places, you are seeing persistent 3D objects that are in a space. So you're gonna see a moment where there's a floating human fl you know, floating through the air, and as we move our head, if you were to move your head in the performance, you would, it would keep, stay in its physical location, and you can like see, see it go come in and out of your frame of view and all of these different things. You as the audience member decided what you were seeing. We were putting some stuff in front of you, but you were able to sort of churn your head and see different things happening as, as the piece goes on. So I'll show a couple of these quick clips here, and then uh, we can chat some more about that. Um. So this is with the curtain down, the big iron curtain that blocks the stage. Try one more time. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, gods of technology. Uh... So one. Another thing just to emphasize again, that the, the theater space that you're seeing in here, this is the physical theater, the actual real Feshpiel house seen through an iPhone or a Android camera, and then these augmented reality objects are floating in front of, as a part of that, uh, that video game that we've made. So this would be so, sort of what you would see as you're watching the show, you would see all of the you know, the floating flower maidens sort of flying through the air as long with the live theater performance.
Yeah, a couple of those things right at the, right at the end. There's a moment in the piece where uh, a spear is thrown at Parsifal and it sort of freezes in midair. So we had a spear that flew at the audience uh, in the glasses and sort of froze right in front of your face. This thing to sort of try and, you know, get people's heart rate going a little bit. <laughs> or the moment when we had the entire festival, the Feshbil house uh, start on fire and then uh, ultimately collapse uh, down on top of the audience to end act two. Um, yeah, so that's sort of like a, the briefest overview of sort of the, some of the technology that we use, some of the ideas that we had behind um, putting this stuff together, and yeah, some quick examples of the work. That's what I got. Yes. They were paying extra for it. So there, were, um, there was a supplemental price that you paid for the glasses. Um, I don't know exactly how much it was. I think it was 60 euros extra on top of the, the, um, the ticket price, the original ticket price. Um, the thing that was really crazy actually is that it sold out almost immediately. So they were very, I was even, tr I couldn't sit at the premiere. They did not have um, a headset for me to wear to see my own work at the night of the premiere because they had sold every single ticket for the entire run uh, before I even had an opportunity to get a ticket. <laughs> Um, we, we only did it for Parsifal, but that piece ran seven performances, eight performances? Um, eight performances over the, over the summer. And at this point, we are sort of the first, this is the first large-scale opera that has used this technology um, in this way. There have been some other theaters that have done um, much smaller use cases. They've done 20 seats, and sort of what they did is they did like um, super titles in the glasses. So you would see the super titles in the glasses or other text information. But this is the first time anyone has done anything with um, live content and the whole performance, and certainly at the scale of 330. Um, when we were first when we first approached the company. Uh, who made the glasses about doing this, they told us that this would be absolutely impossible and there's no way that we'd be able to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a um, question. Did um, Bayreuth, Katerina approach MIT or did he? Here, do you want this one? Maybe we could sit here for a second. Uh, Katerina approached uh, me originally. Katerina approached me or originally, yeah. Not knowing, not knowing actually at the time that I was uh, involved with MIT. Yeah. That was a few years ago? That was in 2018, January. Ah, yeah. terrific. So, yeah. Yes, I want to congratulate you on that. I think Wagner would love you guys. I really do. No, Be because absolutely it's, not. Oh, it's so inventive. <laughs> no it's way. so, I, I do, because, I mean, if Wagner was one of the artists, you know, who was up for something new. Well, I, I love this debate. I do think this is a, a debate that we've been um, hearing uh, going into this piece, but then also coming out of it, is would Wagner have liked this idea? And some say... Yes, absolutely. He was thinking of this very immersive, this way of totally surrounding us and creating a, um, a wholly encompassing piece. And then others would say, absolutely not. <laughs> this is not what he would feel is a good it's not idea. It's really that I prefer that to a live, to a real life performance. I really think I still prefer the live performance. However, I think that the imagery, it could definitely add to the fantasy, to the power of the opera itself. I mean, I really feel that, Barry, and I congratulate you on your work. You were next. <clears throat> yeah, so as someone who saw it, I think the most crazy thing was not that it sold out immediately, the most crazy thing was I actually got a ticket. I couldn't believe that. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I have, I put in my order every year and I got a ticket to the ring cycle and I laughed at your uh, Siegfried saying they had just seen the dragon in the theater and everyone was upset because there was no dragon in this ring. <laughs> 
So, um, but congratulations on it. It was, um, you know, it was a wonderful experience to be able to see that. And obviously, you know, being the pioneers, there are a lot of things to be worked out. Um, from the, you know, leaving aside the glasses issue, I think the one thing that struck me is how do you balance what goes on in AR versus what's going on the stage. And I think the single best example is when we went out for the break, my friends who were in the non-AR um, seats and their friends were raving about how beautifully done the whole thing with Amfortis's wound was. And I had missed that because I was watching something else in my glasses. And so, you know, the ability to balance so that when you want the focus on the stage versus when you can have the room to add something, have you, is that something that you thought about in designing this? That, that was um, super front and center in the, in, the, in the process to like figure out how we were going to make these two things talk to each other and in effect augment each other. Um, the the one thing that we hadn't counted on, and it's because you know I we had not, no one has ever worked in Bayreuth before because no one ever directs multiple times in Bayreuth, right? So everyone is a first timer, and uh, in Bayreuth the the process goes like this: you spend two weeks lighting it before the singers arrive, um, so they're extras, and you kind of like. You, you develop the lighting design for two weeks and the technical design for two weeks prior to their arrival. And then the singers arrive and then you start staging it. And of course, I mean, for me, for me, the ideas that come with the performers are also quite important. I think of them as artists, not as, I don't know, puppets. So, so things change. And, and then we're like, oh, we need to like, make the AR match the staging and um, and these two these two workflows are incredibly different animals because I think we had one no wait we had two full run throughs with all of the tech and all of the costumes prior to uh, the premiere that's crazy so we only got to see the whole thing happening in all of the tech and, in, and with the lighting and the video and the haze. And when the audience comes into the theater, haze and fog work very differently. And so you, you basically couldn't see the video through the headset because it was too blown out a bit. You could, and it wasn't great without the glasses either, in my personal opinion. We'll fix that. But yeah. Wild. I mean, one thing I will mention when you were talking about getting the heart rate up very early in the fast first act, and you probably know what I'm talking about, you had the insects come out, and then there's one that comes right to the lens of your glass, and the whole section of 330 people all jumped like that at once at the, at the experience. And so I'll, one more quick question, and I'll pass it on. Um, how did the artists... Uh, feel about this? The musicians, the singers, other people, did you have any um, special conversations on that? Um, uh, yeah, many, 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 many. And um, uh, people uniformly loved it. And one of the things that surprised me, I mean, in the United States, opera has a hard time surviving, right? We all know, like, even like our big, you know, cities like Boston, They'll, they'll manage to do three performances of a major work, right? It's very difficult. We, we have no repertory opera houses outside of a very few, like the Met. And, and so in Europe, opera houses are also beginning to close. And it's becoming more and more difficult for some, in some places, some countries, for opera houses to really continue to thrive. Their outreach has been not great. I think Germany is quite different because it's much more adventurous and I think it's just so much more adventurous. But there's a lot of hope that things like AR or VR or et cetera, you know, can help to energize younger audiences. I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I think in some ways um, it's, it's, it's changing the debate and people were very, very excited about that. Well, 
similar follow-up. Some prima donnas hate any distraction at all, and this, for various reasons, is distracting. And when they hit their high note, if they see 330 people looking to the left or something, some prima donnas would be very upset, but you're indicating that the artists liked liked it, did not consider it a distraction from their artistry and their connection with the listener. Yeah, because, um, you know, well, partially because of the way we worked, you know, so because of the way the rehearsal process unfolded, because of our engagement with the whole house in terms of the design, you know, I, I think it was a really, really lovely rehearsal process, and I think everyone really trusted it. And then we made glasses available for folks during the rehearsals. So, you know, when you're not in a scene, you could run out into the auditorium and see what's going on. And um, folks were really excited about it. Yeah. I was quite nervous. I was very nervous, including Steph Stefan Gould, who, uh, you know, I, it's like, you know, the, you know, the great Wagnerian singer of, of our times. And, um, he, he loved it. I was so nervous going to talk to him. I thought, oh my God, he's going to kill me. Yeah, I do think the opinions might be a little bit different uh, when, <laughs> because they're not seeing themselves on the stage when those things are happening. But yeah, we had a wonderful moment with Stefan Gould when he came out and saw it and like saw the possibility and was very excited about it. And I think that was... That was sort of the feedback that we got from a lot of the performers who were able to come out and see it in the glasses and see this added element. You know, now that said, they weren't watching the whole performance. They weren't, they weren't on the stage in those, those moments. But I think that seeing the potential and the possibility of it is very exciting for a lot of people right now. Um, well, I have a question from both ends of the process. First of all, I just want to say um, I felt very lucky because I was in Germany and I was able, we didn't get to Bayreuth, but I was able to see the entire performance without the VR um, in a movie theater, sitting in a very comfortable chair, nice and cool, and it was wonderful, you know, and so all of these complaints you hear about Bayreuth, we didn't experience. And I have to say, I've been to a lot of live operas in Germany, but this was really spectacular that even in a movie theater, without the VR, it was fabulous. So my question to, to the beginning of the process is, you, you mentioned that, and I know that there's a lot of power coming from the audience in, as to what, what gets done. How, how much access did you have directly to people who are doing or did it all go through Caterina or whatever the administration? Or do people in the, in developing this were they? Did you have access to this, the Wagnerian, the Bayreuth uh, audience as you were developing it? Do you mean? Uh, did they talk with you? Did you converse like with the, them? Like the, uh, mm. you mean the, the die Freunde? You know, die Freunde, yeah. uh, die Gesellschaft der Freunde Bayreuth. Uh, yes, I was in, constantly in touch with the um, the sort of administrative director of the Gesellschaft der Freunde Bayreuth. Um, we were regularly in touch. I don't know, you know. Did they have a lot to say about exactly how you were going to do this? Uh, or, or not how, but it, the effect that it would, the effects? No. 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 I mean, we conceived of the piece for 2,000 headsets, and which, you know, we were told by people who knew um, a lot about the technology to not try to do that, that it would fail. <laughs> Multiple times. Very good advice. I mean, anything new will fail <laughs> at some point, and maybe multiple times. Uh, so we... Um, we forged ahead, and yeah, it took it took a while, and then uh, actually a somewhat elegant and simple solution emerged. Bravo, Josh. Yeah. Yeah, I will say one of the things that was was the most challenging about the whole process is that we weren't able to ever see all of the elements together 
until the final dress rehearsal, really. So we did tests with audiences there where we would basically like play the entire first act and have them watch content in an, in an early form. Um, we had during our one of our early piano rehearsals, the third act and we ha everyone watched the piece. And um, for those who did actually see the AR, one of the big comments that came out of that was that the AR was too boring and there was uh, not enough content in it. And then one of the big comments that we got afterwards was that there was too much content. There were too many things going on. I couldn't focus. I couldn't see the wound and the AR and these other things. And so I do think that it is, um, you know, this, this year was a great experiment. Um, it's funny that we did it at the world's largest, <laughs> on the largest stage for this kind of thing as an experiment. But um, I think we started to see the places where the AR content was, there was too much happening or that there are moments when it feels too repetitive and it's too long and when we want to emphasize the things on the stage more and when we need to pull back um, other elements so that things can work together. And it is something in these kind of performances where everything needs to work together, but you don't get them all together until, you know, in a certain way until it's too late. So I do think that after this great experiment, hopefully next year, now we're able to go back through the piece and find those moments when we want to be able to focus on the wound and not draw the attention too much in the AR. And then find the moments when we do want to really emphasize the AR or the things that are there and just find ways that all of those things can play in concert together. Because that is sort of the great power of opera is that we get live performance and music and visuals and you know the lights and the set and all of these things together. Um, yeah, so it's just, I'm, I'm excited for the future of it. Um, just deep, deeper to, to your question, um, no one, uh, very, very, I should say very few people, but no one from the uh, Gesellschaft, from the sort of board of directors, um, came into the sort of rehearsal space. They were not around. Um, there were a few people around for the tests, some like, you know, some like major funders and some major like major thinkers, you know, came for the tests that we that we did. And so we we did have a number of meetings with with people from outside of the sort of inner administration or whatever the artistic leadership of the of the house. Um, but those tended to be like quite productive situations, actually. Um, and and I have to say, Katarina Wagner as an artistic director it's rare in a house where I've, I have felt so supported, actually, you know, because we were up against like really a monumental challenge that like I couldn't be, I could never say like, yeah, 100% it's gonna work, no problem. I could never say that with a, a straight face, although I did multiple times, but I was like, there's no way that this is like 100% guaranteed. I mean, neither is anything, right? But. I mean, we can't walk down the street and have a phone call without our cell phones dropping out. And we're trying to play 300 cell phones with the high-end glasses to run for four or five hours at a time just to watch the fact that it didn't all burn up down was terrible. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I will remember, we're not supposed to, we're contractually obliged to never talk about what happens, you know, behind the, the behind the scenes, right? But there was a beautiful meeting where it was like, this is like gonna go sideways. And Katarina Wagner at a certain point like looked at me, looked back at the group and said, we're doing it, basta. And like walked out of the room, that was it. <laughs> so great, I, lo I loved it, yeah. So I'm sorry, I have another little question, but it's the other end. Oh, sorry, the other end of the process. And we've touched on this before. So I'm very excited about what's gonna happen in the future. And um, I you know, agree with all the actors and the musicians, whatever, they see this as a great process, a possibility. But I'm also thinking, just because it's a development of, of the artistic world, that in fact, the, the fact that you're doing this and the fact that other people will experiment this way may actually open other ideas for opera that might not necessarily have to do with VR, t whatever, technology, but just another way, because I was really thrilled with just the way you did the performance. So I just thought, I'll just say that. I think, you know, I'm, I'm imagining there's lots of room for development in that respect. 
I think that these technologies in the right hands um, have, have the actual possibility of making, of like really opening the doors, like really increasing access on a monumental scale, you know? Like I think, I think the biggest problem with, you know, audience development and opera and so, so forth is that folks don't necessarily feel invited, you know, particularly, you know, younger, maybe young, young people don't necessarily feel like, oh, this is a place for me to go. I, I'm invited there. And the risk is high because it tends to be kind of costly. It's expensive. Um, so the, the kind of risk, the, the risk factor is difficult. You know, when you're not quite sure that it's been made for you and you got to pay a lot, uh, maybe... Maybe I won't blow my entire budget for you know entertainment for the month on one opera, right? For the year. <laughs> for the year. Um, and so I think that AR has the potential, and VR, and all of these technologies have the potential to really, really open access. You know, to really open the ability to access some of these great, you know, great and interesting works. I will say also as a designer of, you know, I, I've sort of designed across a many, many different fields, scenery and lighting and video projections and video projections has sort of been the main thing that I've done the last 15 years of my career. And actually one of the reasons I was the most excited about starting to work with Jay when we first worked together nine, 10 years ago was his use of video in his performances. Now at the time, and even up to that point, people said, video is, has no place in theater. Why are we doing this? This isn't film. Like, why are we putting this technology here? It's just getting in the way of the Shakespeare that's there or whatever, you know? <laughs> and I do think that one of the things that we found is that over, the, over time and over as we begin to play with the tool and find out new ways to use it, it's not always successful, but there are many moments where it has turned a performance into something that is completely different than it would have been without that design field or that technology or that... Um, that vision. And I, I think this is one of those experiments in this direction. Do I think it, it should happen on every show? Absolutely not. The reason we go to theater is for live physical things. I go to the theater and not the, the movies because I want to see a physical person and an object and a thing. But these moments when all of a sudden some, you know, the, the spirit of a thing is able to come up and be conjured in front of my face, it's it's a miracle, it's miraculous, it's amazing. So I do think that there are pieces where this kind of technology might really find a home. Um, and I'm very excited to see what people do with it as it becomes more common and more ubiquitous. Yeah, so um, it's not just young people who don't feel welcome. I had invited two friends who had never seen a Wagner opera and the wife was terrified of coming to Bayreuth because she didn't feel that she was up to it. But I, um, I'm curious, what was the reaction from, did, did you get, I assume you got some reaction from people who actually saw it not knowing what they were going in and also what was the professional critics reaction? Not that that matters. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I admit I do read them and I, um, you know, and, and I'm better at like taking the bad ones, you know? I used to be, I couldn't get out of bed, but now, now it's like, it's okay. I'm like, okay, you're really mad, that's okay. You had to use a thesaurus to come up with new ways to write bad things. That's cool, go for it. Um, <laughs> that's, yeah, exactly. Um, I found it interesting, you know, the major, the major and very difficult critics in Germany, um, the Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Welt, uh, Nachtkritik, um, uh, were all, I thought, actually like super positive. And I was really quite impressed, I was like, I could have written this um, in the uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, like really like catching like all of the like very, very covered references to Cyberberg and to like a, a kind of like whole sea of um, of reading that I, I had not actually expected, you know, because there's, there's like little Easter eggs in the history of Parsifal um, embedded throughout the thing, but quite subtly and not in an overt way at all. And I was just like, wow, 
how do you, what, huh? I mean, maybe he knows someone who was involved in the production and I don't know that. But um, I was quite impressed with that review. Uh, one thing I, I would say, you know, also uh, back to the previous question, reading the, the criticism of the opera began like roughly a year and a half before we opened. It was like literally like monthly articles, big, huge articles about, I think one of them was called uh, End of the Dynasty, right? Like End of the Dynasty, you know, and it was all about the sort of hope, hope, I don't know what it is. Like it was just very pointed at like moving beyond uh, the Wagners being in control of the Bayreuth Festival. And, um, and at a certain point, the noise became so loud, it was very difficult to concentrate for me. So I actually did have to shut that out. I had to just like really stop listening. Yeah, yeah I was gonna say, I mean, there were definitely some reviews that were terrible. I mean, getting to hear that your work looks like a hellish screensaver is not everyone's favorite uh, comment. But yeah, there were some incredibly, you know, there were some great reviews as well, and then there were some terrible, terrible reviews. And actually, I mean, I do think the thing that was the most exciting about it is the conversations that started, even like this conversation that happened in the front row, which is, was it worth, you know, would Wagner have liked this? Would he have not? I loved it. I hated it. Just to hear the absolute, the extremes on both sides of that, I think maybe is a testament that we are doing something that is exciting and adventurous and scares some people and excites some people and some people hate it and some people love it. Um, there was <laughs> one of my favorite comments that I overheard somebody say was like, I use the original AR. I close my eyes when I go to an opera because I don't even want to be bothered by the staging. I'm just here for the music. So it's like we're already up against these tough critics that are, <laughs> you know, they don't even want to see staging, let alone you know, video games in front of their face the whole time. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that it's exciting to actually see the conversation start and, and to hear that we're, we've pushed something forward. It's, it's new, nobody can compare it to anything else because nothing else has been like it yet. So that's exciting. The whole opera? So oh, it was. Oh. So there is three and a half hours of augmented reality content that happens through the whole production. Wow. So every moment of the piece, I mean, actually, this, this is an interesting thing, actually, that um, we designed it like that very intentionally because um, it was really easy for people to think the glasses might be broken or that the computer had stopped working. So we actually needed to have something in there, even if it wasn't moving or incredibly active. Like in the first act, there's just like trees on the sides. And so they're not in front of the stage, they're off to the side, but it became really important that every moment had something happening or some content so that people didn't think the technology had broken. So an interesting design challenge. <laughs> Was actually there any involvement by other professors from MIT, like Marcus Thompson, who is from the music end? Did you talk with any of these people? Or just the well, people? Marcus is a dear friend, and we always talk with Marcus, but... Um, have something to say. Uh, well, he loved the uh, VR project, because he was he's in the yes, VR piece, I know right? Yes, so, he was an image, but yeah. was he more involved than that? Um, you know, originally he said he was going to... Uh, try to make it uh, to Bayreuth, and I actually, um, I actually um, bought a ticket for him, um, but he then couldn't make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, you know, I, I did. Um, I had a fellow. I, I was part of a fellowship through MIT Nanotechnology, um, which was undertaking to do some research around new ways by which to make use of augmented and, and virtual reality. And, and so I was a fellow in the nanotechnology department f with uh, research funding from NCSoft, which is a South Korean, a major South Korean video game company. And so they funded the first, basically the first year of our, of our research. Yeah. So there was a, a lot of involvement from those guys. And then, um, and in fact, they told us like, it's not going to work. <laughs> the, the, the NCSoft guys were like, no, don't do it. It's not going to work. But they did still give us money to try, which was fantastic. Yeah. 
Another question? Uh, I'm curious to know, do you see this going beyond the visuals? Maybe this is the engineer in me who wants to know, like, do you see this in the future when the arrow is l released, we actually feel the impact? You know, we can wear these different type of actuators and sensors, and this is going to be something just beyond something that we see in the... Yeah, absolutely, and it exists, actually. So there, there are suits that you can wear with, like, kind of compression equipment, so... You know, if you're playing one of these boxing games, you can feel yourself be hit and stuff. But, um, the, you know, people do wear formal wear at, in Bayreuth. And um, <laughs> can you imagine wearing one of those suits? You would die. It's so hot in there in the summer. Yeah. I do think, I, yeah, I was going to say, I, I do think that it's sort of different, <laughs> different design elements for different kinds of productions. And one of the things that's powerful about Bayreuth is that you feel the music, like you sort of feel it in your chest, you feel it in the ground. And so, for instance, years ago I worked on a, a film where in showing it we put vibrators underneath the seats so that when something would boom, the seats would shake and wind would blow and scents would be pumped into the room. And I do think that there's sort of a limit to what you can, <laughs> what you can do in that space and, and for those pieces. And in fact, you, you do want to allow the more powerful elements to continue to exist. And, and at Bayreuth, it is the music. Like ultimately, that is why people are there and that is why you go to this specific house to hear these specific um, songs and these specific um, pieces of music is because they're really meant for that room. So. Maybe at Bayreuth we don't do that, but maybe at MIT or for some other show we start putting on haptic vests to people so that they can feel the vibrations. But uh, <laughs> might be too much there. <laughs> do, you want to work, do you want to work on it? Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Come on over. <laughs> we're, we're, Three, four, five Vassar Street. You can come to the building. Yeah, come hang out. Yeah, come come hang come hang out. Yeah. yeah. Can you can you can you capture the video somehow or the VR on a on a video? Do you have an idea of? I think I heard that you might be doing this. That's why I wanted to ask. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think the, the honest truth is like the the limitation as always is money. Yes, um, of course. So yeah. the technology exists to capture this kind of stuff. It's in fact it's used a lot for you know sporting events. So if you watch the NFL or soccer and you see. The, you see the first down line on the field. All of that is using an augmented reality through professional video um, tools. The limitation is just that it's incredibly expensive to do. So hopefully, you know, there will be some idea that we can show this with the cameras that are set up to record the shows at Bayreuth in the future. Um, well, just watching your little snippet, I was thinking, you know, I wouldn't mind just watching the virtual reality with the music. <laughs> and I'm sure they won't allow you to do a video of the, of the actual actors, because that's, of course, you don't, there is no such thing, right? It's yeah. having I, a performance on a, well, we, on a CD, but, but perhaps just your end of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the film that you saw in the theater, I mean, we talked with them about yeah. adding the AR to that moment. And so there was a moment where they record this for Blu-ray, and they were like, can we make it as a, a special Blu-ray menu that you can like, play this for part of the, the movie? Um, and again, it, it just came down to money, like not quite being, having the finances to do that idea yet. Um, I do think one of the things that is limiting about it and is hard is even in my videos, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't really translate in the same way because you have a different autonomy when you're wearing the headset. Like you get to look around and see the things. And so there's a control that is lost in, in seeing it. Just the same way that we lose something in seeing the live opera when we see it uh, in the cinema. So, hopefully, maybe someday it'll be there, but I don't know that it'll translate in the same way. People looking over to the left, and that I know as people looking over to the left, I looked over to the left and I saw a big moon. And so, for the rest of the performance, most of us with the AR glasses would periodically look around to see if there was something we were missing. 
Yeah, and the show, it does look completely different from every seat. It is customized for every single seat that is there. So even me, like I had been watching the whole show from the middle seats the whole time, and the final dress rehearsal I watched from the very top balcony, and all of a sudden I was seeing things I'd never seen before because they translate differently, because they're moving in a 3D space, and so wherever you're seated is your perspective. Um, so yeah, I do. <laughs> I do think that that gets lost in those moments, but it is, it's one of the exciting things that I do think this technology kind of has a, a future in these kind of performances. I think this is one of the longest question answers we had here since two years out of the game. <laughs> it shows me that, that, that's a very special moment. Thank you so much for having opportunity for us to show behind the curtains to witness a tiny work. Thrilled, I guess. And we have the opportunity to talk a little bit later in the back room. Thank you so much, Jay and Joss.